After doing this for more than 10 years, I think a lawyer who's interested in handling these types of claims, the big takeaway should be talk to somebody who's done this before. So much of what we use in this business is not written anywhere. You can't read how to fill out a proof of loss. You can't understand the subtleties of what goes on within handling a claim. And what I've learned is having a mentor, somebody who's been there before you and has dealt with these issues is the best way to learn how to handle these claims. In order to be skillful in handling these claims, I think number one, you need to be curious. You need to be curious enough to read everything you can that's in the uh, FEMA website. You need to read the adjuster's manual. You need to read the NFIP manual. You need to be familiar with where they're coming from and how they do this. You need to have some understanding of building construction. If you cannot read and understand an estimate that's been presented to you by your client, you cannot identify whether or not they've had a loss and that there's additional damages they might recover. Finally, you need to uh, be able to understand and fill out the documents that are so technical, particularly the proof of loss. To me, the key to your client making a recovery is the proof of loss and the documentation necessary to support that. So you need to be as well informed as you can be about that from whatever source, from whatever other person who can help you with that so that you can master that skill. The number one resource is another lawyer who does this. I, I cannot stress that enough. I have had two conversations this week with friends of mine who essentially would be in any other world a competitor, but we are not competitors. Lawyers who do flood insurance claims tend to work together because we are all attempting to recover money from WIOs and from FEMA. And so we have a common defendant that we're all after and we're glad to help each other pursue that. Number two, it's being informed. Know what the latest bulletins are. Know what the resources are. Uh, go to the FEMA websites, go to the bulletin websites, uh, read any of the uh, pieces of information you get. I found that when I read the FEMA insurance adjusters manual, I gained so much information about how they think and how they work, and that helps you deal with the issues you'll face when you're handling a, a flood claim. Let me start <clears throat> by saying thank you. Uh, I, for the last 20 years, I've served on the board of a nonprofit on the west side of Houston. 80% of our uh, clients are Hispanic. Uh, I know that about 40% of them are undocumented. Uh, the service you provide is something they cannot get anywhere else. I know the volunteer lawyers come out to our center four times a year and provide services. Uh, what I do as a lawyer with flood insurance is largely with people who have larger claims because economically you can't do it. The largest cross-section of people who need help are the ones with the smaller claims and lawyers cannot, who want to make a living and pay for their rent cannot afford to take these cases and you'll understand why later. So I just want to public address, say I thank you for what you do and I wish I had done more of this when I was a young lawyer like you are. But I'm going to talk about something that I will scratch the surface off today and let me tell you this. Flood lawyers are different than anybody else because we, though we compete for clients, we're all on the same side. I have talked this week with two lawyers who are in direct competition with me for clients in Harvey and in Irma. This is a very, very difficult field. It is very technical and I can barely scratch the surface. It took me about three or four years to fully comprehend it. The good news is what we do is we give back. If you ever have a question and you can find my name and phone number, you call me and I will answer your question or tell you how to, how, what you need to do because it is, it is a, you will understand some of the problems, but we're not going to dive very deep in this today. Let me tell you first, let's start by talking a little bit about uh, what flood insurance is. It is funded by the federal government. Uh, every policy that is a FEMA policy is exactly the same language. Every policy is the same. The only thing that will change is the declarations page. In any insurance policy, there is a declarations page. It says how much coverage there is, where the people live, what their owner's name is. That's true if it's this building or if it's somebody, a private homeowner. So you need to see the deck page for your client. 
But otherwise, the policies are identical and the laws are identical. Now, there's one exception to that. <clears throat> and for the first time in 12 or 14 years of doing this, I came across the first two private flood insurance policies I've ever seen. Apparently, there's a company in Utah that will write, public, uh, will write a private insurance policy because you will see that a FEMA policy is limited in, in how big a policy you can get. Uh, these are the only things they cover. 250 is the most you can get. 100,000 for your contents is the most you can get. And then those other two coverages are a subset of that. There is something called increased cost of compliance. If your house is flooded and the government says in order to repair your house, you're going to have to raise it or your house is so badly damaged you're going to have to demolish it, you can use the $30,000 to do that. It counts against your 250 total. So you have to be careful about that, but that's just some additional coverage. They also will do debris removal. That is, get trees and limbs and stuff out of your yard. But typically, a flood insurance policy does not apply to anything outside the perimeter walls of the building itself. The residents, it does not go to uh, fences or anything else. It will cover a detached garage, but only to 10% of the face value of the policy. So if you have a $250,000 policy, your garage, if it's not attached to your house, well, they can cover it up to $25,000. Now, one of the tricks about that is there better not be anybody living in that garage because the first thing FEMA will do is say that's a residential area because somebody's living in the garage, and if they are, you have to have a separate policy for that garage if somebody is living in it and it's detached. Lots of tricks. Okay, I'm going to basically take you through what you would do so you can understand how the process works of filing a claim. Somebody walks into your office and they want to file a flood insurance claim. Here's what you got to do. You got to notify the insurance company. You need to get notice out to make sure that the client has notified the insurance company or they have called their agent and said, you need, I want to report a claim. <clears throat> you cannot take too many photographs. Photographs are the critical key to proving your claim later because if it gets demolished or repairs are made, you can go back and show, look, here's this, here's that. I, have, I had one elderly lady and we were sitting in the offices of Allstate, and they said, I said, wow, there's a lot of stuff in these pictures that aren't included in the contents claim. And they said, right now, in everything you see, they paid her over $40,000 additional contents just because I could sit and look at her photographs and pull things out of those pictures and add them to her list. So photographs, you can't take too many. It's a great thing to have. The, an adjuster will come out. They'll look at the property. One of the problems we've had in Harvey is because Irma happened right after Harvey. The adjusters who were here working on the claims in Houston, about a third to a half of them took off and headed for Florida because they wanted to be in Florida because there were a lot of wind claims over there and they get paid better on wind claims than they do on flood. So half the people left. The other problem is they were way underqualified because there were so many claims. As a result, what should have taken the typical process is they come look at your house. Within 30 days, you will have an estimate of your damages, and then they will either write you a check and, and get you on down the road. Uh, they didn't do that in Harvey. I had a client who, this happens in August, their first check is January. So that's the kind of problems we're having. Incompetent adjusters, overwhelmed, uh, just too much work to do. One of them said, Send me your public adjuster's report, and we'll use that, and we'll pay you off that. So that's what happened. Uh, you, you need to stay in contact with the adjuster and, and force them to keep moving along if you can. <clears throat> Once you start the claims process, get everything in writing. One of the great things you'll find is when you get the claims file from the insurance company, the, every email that occurred in that case is in the file. It's a great source of information because you can find out what they were doing, what they were talking about, and what your client may or may not have said to them because you may find out reasons why they don't want to pay you. Uh, we're going to talk about proof of loss in a minute, but the proof of loss is the key to a flood insurance claim. What the federal government has the authority to do through FEMA is they can say, 
okay, on the initial phases of the claim, when we're sending our adjusters out to adjust your claim, we're going to waive the requirement of a proof of loss. It is a technical requirement under the policy that you have a proof of loss in order to get paid. It's not required if FEMA waives it. They waived it in Harvey. They waived it in Irma. So an insurance company uh, representative could write a check to the insured without a proof of loss. That becomes a problem later because it hamstrings your ability to write your own proof of loss if you've never done one before because a lot of the information you'd like to have to write your own proof of loss is on that one that the insurance adjuster wrote. I found out a lot of them did actually write them, so uh, they did, even though they weighed the requirement, uh, they didn't, uh, they still did it. Uh, <clears throat> one of the other things about this, what historically happens is the adjuster comes out, he looks at the house. If he thinks it's a legit claim, they will write an initial check. They'll check your coverage, see if you've got content, see what your structure is. They will write you a check. They'll write you a check to get started on repairing your house, and they'll also write you a check uh, to help you start uh, getting some contents back in your house. So you'll get those two preliminary checks. What happened in Harvey, because of the socioeconomic situation in Houston and so many people having very expensive houses that got flooded, they wrote very large initial checks. Some people got $50,000 for their structure and as much as twenty-five dollars or $30,000 on contents. If they give you that check, put it in the bank and cash it. One thing about flood insurance, if the government offers you money, take it. It never cuts off your claim. Technical defenses later from the policy will cut off your claim, but the fact that they've given you a check or paid you, even if it says this is the final check, it's not. It's not. Only the technical aspects can cut you off. The client should deposit the check and keep it because that's money that they've been given by the, by the insurance company. There's normally a 60-day proof of loss deadline to file your proof of loss in, a, in insurance. If you go look in a, a, a flood insurance policy, it will say this. And that means when Harvey hit, you only had 60 days to determine all the damages you'll ever have, fully document it, and file a sworn proof of loss. Fortunately, FEMA recognizes that that's not a factual possibility because they're just overwhelmed. In Harvey, they actually extended the deadline for one full year. So the proof of loss deadline for Harvey, and it's going to be true of Irma, and I don't remember what the date of Irma was, but it'll, it, and it depends on when you flooded. There were three, three different days in Houston. Some people flooded on the first day on Saturday or Sunday, and then when they let the dam go out in, out in West Houston, it flooded a whole bunch of houses that had not flooded. So their date of loss is different than everybody else's, so that's important. So in this case, uh, you, you have a year, and that is in August it'll run. Now, the lawyers that I'm working with, we are about to petition the, 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 the Department of Insurance director to write a letter to the government and extend the proof of loss deadline for at least another six months. He has, we, have received, we have obtained a copy of an inside memo at FEMA that says, hell no, we're not going to give an extension. But I know some people who've actually talked to the guy, and they said if the Department of Insurance petitions him, he will consider giving the extension, and we think he will. One of the <clears throat> fallacies you will see is insurance, agent come, insurance adjuster comes out, looks at your claim, pays you your initial money, writes your proof of loss, writes you the final check. The minute you take that check, the insurance company reports that as a settled claim. Now, you, they may have paid you half of what your claim is worth, and you're going to pursue further damages. When it gets back to D.C., that counts as a settled claim. So when you look at the statistics within FEMA, it shows that in Harvey, about 90 to 95 percent of the claims have been closed. And I can tell you that's not true because I'm sitting on cases and a whole lot of other people are sitting on cases where the clients have been way underpaid. And so they're going, there's going to be a lawsuit and additional claims. Uh, proof of loss is a tricky animal. You, and I, I've tried three cases over this, and I've deposed the head of claims for some of the largest insurance companies. Nowhere, anywhere in the Code of Federal Regulations in the statutes related to FEMA with regards to these insurance policies, in the adjuster's manual 
or in the FEMA manual is there are their directions on how to fill out a proof of loss. There's no information about it, and it is a weird document. And if you don't understand the vernacular that goes with it, you're going to have a really hard time filling one out. That's why it's important if you have trouble, call somebody like me and let me help you do it. Because once I've explained it, and if you can see those documents that the insurance adjusters got, you'll understand where some of those numbers came from. What I've discovered, and I w I've spent some time looking at some documents a public adjuster sent me, they have no clue how to fill one out. I saw one and went, holy mackerel, this, you're going to submit this for your client, and their client's going to swear this is true and correct, and they're immediately screwed because the information they have been provided is, or providing is totally wrong. It's totally wrong. So, uh, so you need to be careful. One of the tricks is... When you file that proof of loss, you need to sit down with your client and say, do you agree that the amount of money we're seeking to recover for you is true and correct? Because if you get to trial, that lawyer for the insurance company is going to ask you that question. Do you believe this is the right amount of money? So they need to have agreed to it. It's a simple step, and they can do it. Okay, here's that proof of loss. Uh, I think I... Um, no. Nah. This. this, if you have the adjuster's report, all of this information up here in the left-hand corner will be filled out. That tells you how much coverage there was. This describes the owner, what the event was, it was flood. Whether there's a mortgage company who needs to be on the check has to be in this blank right here. And then there are all these lines. Full amount of insurance. That'll be the total of what they have up here, and it goes there. Then actual cash value of the building structure. That is a tricky question because what that means is <clears throat> right before the flood hit this house, how much was that building worth? How much was it worth? And one of the tricks the insurance companies use is their adjusters will calculate that number and they'll give some real low number. You may have $250,000 in coverage and you may have a house that has a market value of $200,000, but the insurance adjuster will say your, your building was only worth $143,000. Now you've got an adjuster's report, I mean your own expert's report says I've got $175,000 in damages. The policy says we will pay the lesser of the actual cash value of the building or the amount of damages. So. By the adjuster saying your building was originally only worth $143,000, you suddenly lost $30,000 or $40,000 of your claim. So I always have my guy make his own calculation of that number. You can also look at HCAD, that's the Harris County Appraisal District, or whatever's in your jurisdiction, to find out what was that appraised for by the building itself appraised for by the County Appraisal District, or did you recently refinance your house? And if you did, was an appraisal done in the last year or two before the storm? Another source to prove that your house was worth more than what they said. Now, <clears throat> this is where it gets tricky down here because you have to have a calculation of what you say the cost of the damages are, the actual cash value of the loss. There are two measures of damages in, an, in a flood policy, replacement cost value, and that typically applies if this is your primary residence. And we're going to just talk about residential claims. If this is your primary residence, it's a replacement cost value policy. That means you don't take depreciation out of the calculation. Does everybody know what depreciation is? That's wear and tear on the house. If you've got, it's like you drive your car off the, part of the lot of the new car dealership. They're going to say the minute you drive off, it's depreciated, it's lost value. Houses do the same thing. Wear and tear, paint gets older, you walk on the carpet, the value of the house goes down from the cost of what it costs to rebuild it. So that's one. If the house is a rental house, these people have two houses. They had the house they lived in, but they also owned another house. If it is a rental property and they didn't live in it, it's only actual cash value. Or if they sell their house, that was their primary residence, but they couldn't afford to rebuild and this process is taking too long or emotionally I can't go through this. I had a 75 year old guy call me and say, what do I do? I just cannot do this. And I said, sell your house, but here's what you're going to lose. You drop the value to actual cash value, which is the depreciated value. But these are all things that play into this. And then down here, 
there's a place where the uh, where your client will read and sign, I've read this and I agree that this is, it is the correct amount of money for my claim. Now, uh, if you disagree with the adjuster's estimate, you need to get your own estimate. Now here's where I think y'all are gonna have your biggest problem. The resources you have available to you are going to be uh, tested because in the claims I take, I hire a, a, my own adjuster and I send them out and they completely redo the estimate. You can, if you do a lot of them, they'll do it for about $750. It can cost as much as $1,500. This becomes very difficult for y'all because one of the tricks to this is the policy says you can justify your claim with contractors' bids, estimates from individual contractors for sheetrock electrical and stuff like that. But the thing is, the insurance company won't deal with that. They'll say, our, our adjuster came in and he did a line by line for every room, and I'll show you one in a minute. And uh, we calculated how much square footage of sheetrock there was, how much carpet there was. We need to compare every room and know that if you had 12 inches of water, you can only cut the sheetrock off at four feet. You can't put a whole wall in. With your estimate, I can't tell what your contractor's doing, so we can't consider this. And that's the reason why the best way to handle a flood insurance company is apples to apples. And you got to have one of these, one of these adjusters exactimate or simsol estimates. And that's the thing, the challenge you're going to have, I think, is that. Unless you have a really good contractor who can say, this bid is based upon only cutting sheetrock to four feet and all these other things so you can defend it, but it, comes, it becomes problematical. One of the other things you will see once you learn about this and you read these, I've never seen a perfect estimate and frequently adjusters leave complete rooms out and one of the things I noticed recently is they leave the exterior out, the exterior walls, and I'm, there's a bulletin, I'm gonna talk to you about that. It is really important because it's one of the biggest elements of damages in a residential claim is the exterior walls, especially if it's a brick veneer house. Uh, so <clears throat> technically they're supposed to pay or deny the claim within 60 days. As I gave you an example, I had clients getting checks. They couldn't deny it because they didn't get their check until January, so they didn't know if they needed to deny it or not. The other important thing to remember is statute of limitations, and this is where it gets weird with these kinds of claims where they don't pay you for a long time. Your proof of loss period is for one year. It starts on the day of your loss. In August of 2017, the proof of loss deadline runs till August of 2018. Statute of limitations runs from the first time that the insurance company in writing denies any or all of your claim. I have a client who has a legitimate claim and they denied his claim because he had a previous flood event and he, they wanted him to prove that he had repaired his house before, uh, before the flood came in Harvey. And so they denied his claim. So his claim got denied early on, so the statute of limitations can run almost as quickly as a proof of loss deadline. So you have to be really careful about that. That's why you want all the paperwork from your client. You want every, every correspondence, piece of correspondence, they have to put it in writing. The insurance company has to document it in writing. Now there's another little thing I'm gonna give you in a little bit that will help you with that that just came out in the, recently. Okay. Once all this is done, here are your options. You can accept the decision of the insurance company. You can file an amended proof of loss. You can appeal the claim. You do not want to appeal the claim. I think our statistics show that of all the claims appealed in Ike, 90, over 95% were rejected. They almost never grant it, and it is an arduous process to prepare one of these things. The other thing you lose is, and this rarely happens, there's a process called appraisal. And if you and the insurance company agree on the scope of damages, but you're arguing about pricing and some other things, you can go to appraisal and get the case resolved because it's binding and you're all done. But uh, you lose that if you appeal. Um, and then 
once you have filed your proof of loss and it has been rejected, you can then file a lawsuit in federal court. And federal court is the sole jurisdiction for flood claims. It's the only place you can go. This is not a valued policy. If the damages, say you got a $150,000 house and you got a $140,000 claim, essentially your house is a total loss. It's not in a flood claim because they, if it was cheaper to tear your house down and build a new one, doesn't matter. They're going to pay you what, exactly what it would take to put your house back as it was before the flood occurred. And so they would only pay you the 140, although you would be better off to tear your house down. But you can, you can choose to do that, and you can just take the 140, tear your house down, and start again if, that's, if you can afford to do that. Okay, this is a huge, the next thing is a huge, huge issue in Houston right now. Substantial damage, and it, it's, it is the root of what's going to be additional problems for us in the future, and there's been lots of newspaper articles about this. The flood insurance program, it, you have this, communities have to petition the uh, FEMA to be a part of the flood process, the flood insurance process, so that they can write flood policies in your area, because some people, places don't have flood insurance because they didn't undertake to do this. But by doing it, the community says, okay, we're gonna be in charge of this. And so their building department is in charge of making sure that the houses are built above the flood, out of the base flood elevation, above the base flood elevation, out of the flood zones and those kind of things. There's a lot of dispute in Houston now, and so one of the things that's happened is they passed an ordinance that all new construction will be built two feet above the 500-year floodplain. Now, we've had three 500-year floods in the last five years, so it's a little iffy about that. But this becomes a big issue because we found out that in Houston, a lot of people are not getting these substantial damage letters. Although they're getting uh, their house is substantially damaged, they're not getting the letters. Now, what that means is your house is worth $150,000. And this is not land. This is just the structure. That's all we're talking about. The house is worth $150,000. The cost to repair is $80,000. Cost to repair is more than 50% of the value of the building. In that case, that building is substantially damaged. If it's determined to be substantially damaged, you can't rebuild it unless you raise the house up to what the, the present uh, flood zone levels are, the base flood elevation determined by an engineer. Uh, and so you have to do that. They're not doing that in Harris County. We're going to get more and more houses that are going to reflood because they let them rebuild right back where they're. Go over to Banana Bend and some of those houses over there on the east side of Houston for those who live here. There was one lady in a newspaper article says she bought her house for $80,000. It's flooded five times. She's been paid over $400,000 in repairs to her house. She's an idiot. I don't know why she lives there and I wouldn't go through that. But think about the cost to us. Our government has paid that woman $400,000 for a house that should have been torn down. She shouldn't be able to insure it, but that's one of the problems with the flood, our flood process. Okay, you can't get any con extra contractual damages in a flood case. You don't recover attorney's fees, you don't recover expenses, you don't recover breach of contract, you can't recover for negligence. There are two cases, uh, opinions in Louisiana that I have read where an insurance adjuster for the insurance company came out and literally gave the wrong information to the insured or lied to them and they lost their claims in both cases and sued the adjuster. Immunity. It's a federal, it's a federal program. All people involved with it get federal immunity. You can't sue. There's no extra contractual damages. The one exception to that rule is, is if your if uh, insurance agent sold you the wrong policy or got you in the wrong zone or did something wrong, that's called procurement of the policy. That is an exception and you can sue that person. In fact, I did that. I had somebody who failed to make the payments for the client on their, on their policy and that was an exception to that rule, so you can do that. Oh, I wanna talk about this. The last thing down there about, this is a weird situation. In a windstorm case under your homeowner's policy in the state of Texas, your insurance adjuster owes you a duty of good faith and fair dealing.
that means that adjuster who comes out can get sued, and so they have to do it correctly. There is no incentive for a flood adjuster. They are paid by the amount of, by the, amount of the loss, and one of the things that's deterring their conduct is after uh, Katrina, the insurance companies had paid all these claims, FEMA went back and audited their files and said, insurance companies, y'all way overpaid these claims, you owe us our money back. And the insurance companies had to pay that money back to FEMA, tens of millions of dollars. Guess what? Next time in Ike, they under they under estimated all the claims because they didn't want to get caught where they had to give money back. It was either try, easier to squeeze the insured and make them try to dig more money out than it was to do it right to start with, and so they don't. And so that's one of the problems. We have been fighting that war for the last 15 years, and we, we are hoping that we're going to make some progress. There's a group of our lawyers who do flood insurance trying to arrange a meeting with FEMA so we can overcome some of these obstacles and have FEMA talk to us directly because FEMA's been under a lot of heat lately in, in Congress because of the things that happened in Superstorm Stan, Sandy and the, some of the Democratic senators up there were really upset about how their, cli their uh, constituents got treated. There's one exception to recovering attorney's fees. In a very few cases, there are zones where uh, WIOs, write your own, that's all state, state farm companies like that who write these policies on behalf of FEMA, can, will not write a policy, and it's repetitive flood zones. It's like that lady out there on the east side of town. FEMA writes that policy. If you sue, you sue the United States government. You sue FEMA, you give notice to the uh, attorney, no, to the secretary, of Homeland Security now gets notice of the lawsuit you serve he or her, I don't remember now. And, uh, and, and in that case, if you plead under the Equal Access to Justice statute, you can get up to $1,500 in attorney's fees. And I think there's a Louisiana case that might allow you to even get more money if, it, if it's FEMA as the defendant, but that's the exception. One of the things, uh, a couple little tricks. I had a client who was a very good contractor who had done all the work on his own home originally. When he flooded, he did it, he, he repaired it himself. FEMA will not pay overhead and profit if you do the work yourself. Overhead and profit is 20% of the claim. 10% for overhead, 10% profit. So you are better off to have a contractor do your work than you are to do it yourself. That guy got compensated $7.50 an hour or whatever the federal minimum wage was at the time for the hours he could prove he worked. He did not get paid what a contractor would have gotten paid. The other thing is that that ACV thing, if you decide your house is so badly damaged that you're not going to rebuild, then you will lose your overhead and profit because the contractor is not going to rebuild your house. So never tell the insurance company until you've fully been paid that you're going to tear your house down. Tell them, oh yeah, we're going to rebuild, we're going to fix it. You want to, you want to do that or you're going to lose 20% of your claim. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of adjusters will say mold is not covered by a flood insurance policy. That is not true. There were situations in Sandy where people's houses were out on these uh, coastal uh, areas along the Atlantic Ocean. They couldn't get to their houses for 10 days, two weeks. Well, guess what happens when the power's off and your house has had water in it in a warm climate? You're going to have mold. If the mold is not because of th something you did, it's because you couldn't get to your house or whatever, mold is covered. But a lot of it will be taken care of when you tear your sheetrock out. So. Anyway, just another thing to remember. Okay, here's why you want to get those adjusters' papers. This is a report that is a standard part of an adjuster's uh, workup on an individual's house. And in this document, there's important information. There's the policy limits confirmed by the insurance adjuster. Here is the date that they contend the flooding occurred. This tells you how deep they measured the water to be in the house because that is a real important issue. 
standard plugs in the wall in the house are about 12 inches off the floor. If the water does not get above those plugs, you can't replace them. And all these adjusters, uh, private adjusters, will always write reports replacing the plug, replacing the wiring, doing all this stuff. They're not going to pay for it because the water didn't get high enough to get into that plug. If it didn't get high enough to touch your doorknobs, they'll replace the door, but you got to use the same hardware again. You got to, they call it replace and reset the, the doorknobs. Uh, same thing on your, uh, your garbage disposal. Water didn't get into it, not going to play. Now it's different if it's salt water versus fresh too. If it's a salt water invasion like we had in, in Galveston Bay, if it touches the wiring in the house, that wiring that got touched by the salt water comes out because the salt water will decay the, uh, the covering on the, over the wire over time. And it also affects, if, it, if your water only got up to say 36 to 38 inches on the wall, they will only pay for you to cut out four feet of sheetrock around your house. If you get higher than that, like we got out on the west side of town where I live, you get the full eight feet to the top of the wall. In some of those houses out there, it was higher than that. They have nine or 10 foot ceilings in their houses. Uh, here is their final report. And this, all those numbers that I showed you in that proof of loss a while ago, here's that information right there for you that they did. And you can take their numbers and adjust it in, uh, in, in the place where it says deductible, you include all the prior payments. You can make those calculations re real quick and do your proof of loss. So that's very helpful. Uh, this is that building valuation report I told you about where in this case, they came up with this house as being worth $151,000, $152,000. The house was insured for two fifty. dollars This did not happen for a long time, but in the last five years, I've seen more and more of this where they make this calculation and they come back and say, even though you got a $175,000 claim, we're paying you one hundred forty-three dollars because we calculated how much your house is worth and this is all it's worth. Here is a proof of loss completed. One of the things you have to be aware of, this looks kind of interesting because the actual cash value of the loss is $295,000. They have already been paid $28,772. So you would think the actual cash value of the, the total claim should be two sixty. dollars Well, they've only got a two fifty dollars policy. So that's the tricky part. If you add $28,772 and $221,227, that average, actually is $250,000. That's the most they can recover. So that's why it's that way. That's why these things are tricky and why you need to talk to somebody about doing them. I told you earlier about an Xactimate estimate. This is what they look like. They literally go room to room and they start, if they do their report right, it'll either be at the beginning or the end of it, it'll start with the exterior. And they, and they will go line by line item because one of the big issues we fought for a long time, if y'all, you may not be familiar with residential construction, but a typical brick veneer house has a stud wall and then on the outside of that stud wall, they historically put a waterproofing barrier called blackboard or some other form of that. Then there's an airspace and then there's a brick veneer wall. And they have that because brick veneer walls breathe. Water goes through them and it'll run down the inside of them so that provides a moisture barrier. What happens is when you have two feet of water come up that brick veneer, it gets into that blackboard and the blackboard will deteriorate and it loses its moisture blocking ability and it has to come out. We have fought with them for years about this. They contended that we should swing the walls out from the inside, put the board on it and swing them back into place and every contractor said you're out of your mind, you can't do that. And there's a bulletin that was issued last fall which you need to be familiar with and in it FEMA has now said if you can show that this brick veneer wall got inundated in water and it has these particular kinds of blackboard, then you are entitled to be compensated for the cost of repairing that. I have a very close friend who is a forensic engineer and architect. He said the only way you can do that is take the bricks off the house. That is a twenty to fifty thousand dollar expense. That's why I said missing the exterior 
is a huge thing with, with if they've had water deep enough to get on these walls. So now the appropriate measure is you get a letter from architect or an engineer saying here's what it was or somebody who recognizes it and they should get a bid to find out how much it's going to take the bricks off the house and then put that back up and then put the bricks back up. And that, that's a huge number now. Um, you see, you can see this here. Vi this one had vinyl, vinyl siding. Remove and replace. You cannot, a, a, a vinyl sided house will typically have wood under layer. It'll have either uh, plywood or some other wood under the vinyl. If that water comes up and, and gets, gets onto that wood, the wood's got to be replaced because it's going to rot. So you got to take the vinyl off. You can't take two feet. The, the house is 15 years old. You think that vinyl's going to look just like it did the day you bought it? If you put replacement vinyl down there on the bottom, you're going to have two shades. Well, it's like painting a wall. You got to paint the whole wall. All the vinyl comes off. You may only replace two feet of wood, but you got to do all the vinyl. So those are, uh, that's another little thing. That's just an example of the kind of things that, that you'll see. So let me tell you about two other things real quick. One of them, to me, is one of the most important things that happen. Um, well, both of them are important. Number one, uh, for years, if you got that preliminary payment and then you got your check, the insurance company determined this is all we're going to ever pay you, and then you made your claim like we did with a proof of loss, the first thing they would say is, Give me receipts and show me that you spent all this money already that we've already given you or we're not paying you any more money. Well, thank God FEMA finally woke up and they have now issued a bulletin and said, you don't have to do that anymore. You present a reasonable estimate and they have to consider it. You do not have to prove that you spent all the prior money and that has been a war with them about that. Now, the other good news is they have now issued a bulletin, and you'll have to get oops, have to get a copy of the bulletin. But it has language in here that you should add to your notice of representation letter when you send it to the insurance company, because what it is, it's a release signed by your client saying, "I want a copy of my claim file." And by this, the insurance company, when they get your notice letter that you represent and your client has signed this notice of representation and asked for and signed the waiver and said, I want the file, they got to give up those documents that I told you you needed to get. So those, are, they, those you can now get. And man, that is just a treasure trove for figuring out what do I need to do to make my client successful in this case. And a lot of times it's as simple as pointing out you didn't include this bathroom. You didn't do the exterior walls. Uh, one of the uh, bathtubs are a huge deal. If you have a fiberglass bathtub, you cannot remove that to do the wall behind it like it needs to be done. It has to be replaced. A lot of times they will either not pay for that or say replace and reset. Can't do it. If it's an iron bathtub, if the water touches it, it's going to rust. It's got to come out. If it is tiled, they put tile up on the wall. You can't, you can't do any of those repairs without taking the tile out. Another common one is they want to uh, re clean, and, uh, clean and reseal the grout. Well, I, think about the water in Houston that was in those houses. Sewage plants, backed up toilets, chemicals from chemical plants was all in that water and it's now in that grout. Do you think you would like to have a house full of grout with all that stuff in it? Mm -mm, you don't want to do that. So those are important issues that you need to, uh, need to be aware of. There is a website, and I've forgotten the name of it, but, but it is, it, you can look on it. It's a, what's that? the one for all the bulletins. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I always get to it by Googling. I just did write your own bulletins, W-Y-O. That's what they call it, and it's the NFIP bulletins. National Flood Insurance Program. And you need to look at those bulletins because they come out regularly and uh, they provide you information. Like it, give, it gives you the date of the extension. It says the one-year extension. All of those things are issued in what are called bulletins by FEMA. Now, I have brought for you today, and they're stacked up on that table over there, and you're all welcome to take one, 
A friend of mine wrote this book about handling flood insurance claims about six years, six or eight years ago. It does not have all the secrets because it's impossible to do it. But this is a good primer on what you need to know about insurance policies and a lot of the things I've told you today. It's only about 100 pages or so, but it is just full of good information. Another thing that you should do is, if, you, if you're going to handle these claims, get hold of the documents that your clients get and read them because it is amazing how much there is not in here. Um, this is the bulletin that's issued every time they mail you a flood insurance policy, and I'm a recipient of that. They mail this to me. Then they send me a letter and say, did you get it? <clears throat> and if you read this, it really there's actually some good stuff in here explaining a lot of things about what pre-firm and post-firm is and elevated and non-elevated and those kind of things. But anyway, they'll tell you in here that the proof of loss is the important thing for you to getting your recovery, but they don't tell you anything about how do you fill that out or any of the other stuff that you need to know about that. So it's a, it's a good piece of information. So with that, does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Has to be at least two acres. Has to be two acres of water, but if the... Flood goes by this rule. If water touches it, it's a flood claim. If water touches it, it's a flood claim. One thing you need to be aware of, stay away from foundation cases. In, when flood cases were originally written, and we have this problem all the time in Houston, one of the problems we see is that after the hurricane, hurricane comes, hurricane goes away, the house settles and you get cracking in the walls and the slab. That's called a subsidence claim. It means literally the water got soggy, the ground got soggy, the weight of the house went into the ground. That is not covered by flood. The only way a foundation claim is covered by flood is if you're near a flowing stream so that the volume of water actually erodes out from under the slab. Your engineer to support your claim better use the word scour or erosion when they are talking about the claim in order to support it but we rarely take those. That's going to be, cover, that's going to be covered by their uh, general property one because those are backed up toilets that cause the flooding up above. So that's going to be covered by the, uh, the one above that. Generally, flood won't cover above the water line, except, yeah. And those are almost all com large commercial property, I mean policies. And I, I pulled, I finally got a friend of mine who's a commercial realtor to get me one of those. And what, the way they're written is, they say the biggest commercial policy you can get for one of these big buildings like the one win, $500,000. What they do is when they write the policy, they say, we expect you to have the, the FEMA flood policy for $500,000. That's your deductible. So you have that policy and you cover the first $500,000 and then we'll cover above that. And they literally cover everything that flood will cause. But there's so many other things when you get a building like this, you get loss of income and uh, and, you know, everything else that goes with it. And, like, I was over trying to park in the, the garage over by City Hall where I always park. They've got the lower floor closed off right now while they're doing repairs. That, that thing's been closed since August and off and on. And it's it just unbelievable how much money they're spending to repair that stupid garage. Mm -hmm. Increased cost of compliance does not include code work. If your house has aluminum wiring in it, and the new building code says you cannot have aluminum wiring, and the city of Houston says in order to rebuild your house, you're gonna take all the aluminum wiring out, not covered by flood policy. They, their, increase, their increased cost of compliance covers two things, raising your house, tearing your house down. Those are the only two things increased cost of compliance. Yes, ma'am. Database like similar to disasterassistance.gov to get documentation or correspondence sent to the client because I know you mentioned we need to get everything that the client receives. Sometimes the clients don't do that. Um, is there request like it from the insurance company? Just, it's okay. there are two files that are the cornerstone of a flood claim, and it's all you need. You don't need anything else. We rarely take depositions, other than a very generic way. We we did depose the head of claims for a couple of carriers to find out how they work. You only need the underwriting file, which is how the insurance company first wrote the policy, and then the claim file, and it will have everything in there 
from the minute the insured called them and told them I have a claim up to, to the time that a lawsuit got filed and then they'll claim privilege after that. Uh, thank you. Um, I've seen one case where they, they received a denial for the increased cost of compliance payment and it was based on your house is situated at this height and the floodplain is at this height, something like that, and it was like an inch or two off. Is there any anything there? Is there I would go get my engineer to go remeasure it. Okay. There, the key to, to these elevation issues is there's a thing called the base flood elevation, BFE is the short term for it, and uh, surveyors or engineering firms with uh, surveyors when you are going to build a brand new house in the city of Houston, you have to have a base flood elevation certificate. And your builder will have some engineer being firm that they use, and they go to your lot, and they determine that the level, the first living level of your house has to be above that base flood elevation, and they have to certify it. And so they, that first they measure it so the, the home builder know how high he's got to build it. And then, then after it's built, they have to come back and remeasure. One of the controversies that's going on right now is they're building a big subdivision out by me where there used to be a golf course. And rather than lift the houses up, they just piled up all this dirt and build the houses up on top of the dirt. And we think that's going it, to, it's going to create additional flooding problems for my neighborhood because the water all flows south. And, uh, and I think it's going to be some other problems, but that's it. Um, earlier you mentioned that if you told the insurance company that you were going to rebuild your home on your own, there was a chance you would lose about 20% of your, um, your award. But what, have you seen any particular issues with individuals who are contractors on their own or own their own contracting company? Can they farm it out to their contracting? Is there, yeah, okay. You own the contracting company and they find out? They're not paying that. Yeah, uh, you can. It has to be totally disassociated. You can. You you can get your brother's company to do it, but right. you can't. If you own the ownership interest in that contractor, you're going to lose your overhead and profit. Okay. Yep. And then my other question: um, Have you seen any supplemental claims being filed for mold regrowth that's been happening due to quick reconstruction? So people who had you know nonprofits come in, tear out the drywall, kind of spray it down for mold, and then two, three days after the hurricane, throw up some drywall, and now you've got mold growing behind it? Is that something? I that can't answer that, with? but I would think that if the circumstances are right, you could argue that that was covered. It, it, the, the question is, did you cause the mold to grow? Did you have a question? Um, so you mentioned that we could possibly sue the insurance company for procurement? Yes. Would, no, agent. Insurance oh, the agent. 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 Oh, okay, the agent. Is there... I, I guess we wouldn't be able to include the insurance companies in a bad faith claim because it would be. If you cannot sue, insure, you cannot sue the WIO. You cannot sue any of the adjusters who worked on the claim, uh, or engineers. Now there was an exception to that in New York. Uh, there was an the was engineering fraud. firms up there gave fraudulent reports and they got sued in, on separate criminal charges by the federal government. And, the, and as a result of that, almost all the flood claims got immediately settled because the, the defense lawyers, a bunch of them from New Orleans that I knew, uh, unfortunately got tied up with an enge two engineering firms that, that issued fraudulent reports. Their engineer would go out and look at the house and say, yep, there's structural damage as a result of the flood. They would go back in an in-house peer review guy say, oh, no, there's no flood damage, and that would be the report. And they found out later what was going on, and they got hammered for that. So, so it would have to be like a systemic? It, it would have to. You, it would be a very difficult thing to prove, yeah. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. For the substantial damage calculation for 50%, that's based on the improvement on land value, not the fair market value, is that right. correct? And does that include <coughs> um, coverage for other structures in the improvement on land? No. Okay. No, it's only the house that's insured. Remember, the flood insurance policy is confined to the perimeter of the building itself, unless you have a detached garage, and then, then you have that issue. But but it's, it's confined to that, yeah. Yes, sir. It seems like to be made whole, you have to already possess a certain amount of disposable income, education, and patience. A lot of the potential clients for this group don't 
have that. So what hardships are you seeing for like these low income, low education? I think all things considered, I think everybody's in the same boat. I think, I think the people that you will serve are going to wind up having problems because they're reluctant to step forward or don't know if it's worth it or not. And the other side, the well-educated and those types of folks will not uh, come forward because they think they're smart enough to do it themselves. So I think there's a trade-off there. Yeah. And okay. remember, call me or I'll tell you somebody to call because I can answer these questions that you have like uh, about using your own business and all that and other questions. Uh, I have given seminars to uh, three or four of the uh, local groups. I've done it at U of H and other places. One thing about flood insurance lawyers, we are happy to share our knowledge. I'm 67 and I'm going to retire sometime. I want somebody to take this and run with it because I, I don't want to do this again. I don't want us to have another hurricane this year, I can promise you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody, it's Sandra again from Lone Star Legal Aid. So I'm the plus one for the flood insurance information. Now that you've heard from the expert, all the basic stuff, um, you'll remember that after Sandy, he was discussing the fact that there were some fraudulent engineering reports and there were a lot of problems with Sandy. As a result of that, they had the Flood Insurance Reform Act of 2014 and one of the things that came out of that is one more tool to use, which is the Office of the Flood Insurance Advocate. And in the past, I worked with a man named Tom Maligno, who was overseeing the clinics at Toro Law School. He had been part of the Katrina Hurricane Network. And after Sandy, they actually had like three judge appeal panels. And Tom and his coworker, Ben Rajate, <laughs> both ended up working for FEMA and working in conjunction after they were done being hearing officers. Um, Tom worked with the Flood Insurance Advocates Office, so he's someone that could tell you about this kind of information as you know, a corollary to Martin being so helpful with the basic flood insurance things. But that's what the Office of the Flood Insurance Advocate is. Okay, there we go, that's me again, thank you. Um, so who it is, what it does, and how we can help at questions and answers, resources, and closing. Essentially, this information, they have a flood insurance advocate fact sheet. If you go to the FEMA page, there's a lot of information there. As um, Tracy and other people have pointed out, um, a lot of their guidance and things are hidden. But the basic information about this office is here. Um, who it is, what it does. So as I was mentioning, it's, it came out as a result of the 2014. What you should think of this is it's an ombudsman office. So if you've exhausted, if you've got a client, and remember, and we'll talk more if you're in the legal services ones, we have to be conscious of the fee generating issues. So a lot of the claims, our target group that we're helping are people with smaller claims. If they have a large claim, Private attorneys like Martin Mayo's office would be interested in that, but people with the smaller claims that can't get the help Martin's talking about. So step one, you would talk to the people and go, okay, what's wrong with the flood insurance offer that they've given you? They've probably already written the proof of loss, given it to them. And you say, well, they gave me 100,000, but my contractor's saying it's 130. He won't do it for less than that. So step one is you take your contractor's estimates, you give it back to the adjuster, you tell them you're helping your client, you try to talk to them and you see what you can do. Sometimes that works. If that doesn't work, this is like one more option if you wanna use it before you file the final proof of loss. But remember, it's just like court. You're getting ready to do litigation, right? Even if you know that it's gonna settle in mediation because 90% of everything settles in mediation now, right? But you have to do your discovery, you have to get everything lined up, take your depositions, whatever you're gonna to do to get ready to go to trial because you've got a scheduling order and you know trial's on the horizon. So for these claims, you know your proof of loss deadline is on the horizon. And if that doesn't win, then you've got your one-year statute to go into federal court and sue the proper party. But this is like your in-between step that's a possibility to use. It's a new program. It hasn't been used by a lot of people. I personally haven't used it. 
What I did is reached out to um, the Meyerland community where I live, where everybody flooded, and some people have been using it with good effect. Some people haven't been responded to, so it's a mixed bag. So, but it is, in theory, an agency that is offering another measure of help. So you could use it if you find it helpful, great. If you don't, you just keep moving on and take the steps that Martin Mayo's explained to you so well. So this is what it's about. It's not just about the flood insurance, it's about the mapping um, and the identification of the risk of floods. What's that? Uh, real fast, if you, they tell you you're in the floodplain but you don't believe you are, you can do a letter. It's a letter of uh, map adjustment that'll point out you get your engineer to measure and look and see the elevation and you go, ta-da, I'm not actually in the floodplain. Then they can give you a, a map adjustment, get you out of the floodplain, that'll drop your flood insurance. That's why it's so important. Your mortgage company requires flood insurance if you are in the floodplain. Um, so if you have a mortgage, that's part of what it's about. Um, so they help with are you or are you not in there. You might be in the floodplain and you get out of the floodplain. Like I got a FEMA mitigation grant, so my house got elevated. So when it's done getting elevated, I get an elevation certificate, I give it to FEMA, the NFIP, and they go, oh yeah, so now instead of 5,000 a year, your flood insurance is gonna go down to 1,000. So what if they deny you? This office can help with that. And there's some huge amounts of number of people they've helped in the report, and this explains why. Um, so um, flood insurance, hazard mapping, floodplain management, hazard mitigation assistance grants. That's what I was just talking about that I was able to get for my house that had flooded. Um, they want you to use existing sources available. In other words, they don't want you to go to them until you've gone to your agent, you've attempted to work it out, you've checked and done everything on the FEMA webpage about flood insurance. So they, they point you more than once to don't contact us until. Um, so one of the things is they educate people about NFIP and its resources. Um, the big theme is trying to tell everybody to have flood insurance. And if, for those that are new to Houston, only about 15 to 20% of Houston had flood insurance. That's why the rest of the people were applying to FEMA. So the more people that have flood insurance, the more recovery money they would actually get. The problem is most of our clients aren't going to be able to afford flood insurance. If you flooded in the past, you're probably in a floodplain. If you're in a floodplain, the bigger waters bill has been increasing the rates because the goal is to get it to the actual rate instead of the subsidized rate. So it's prohibitively um, expensive. Assistance over unresolved issues. OK. Um, beneficial financial income consumers resulting in claim payments. Okay, that's why I wanted to bring this to your attention. People that are trying to work it out, this is like the last thing before you get your proof of loss and go file a suit. Um, premium reductions, if you think your premium's been miscalculated, were you grandfathered, were you not grandfathered, did they not give you that exception, they can get people claim reductions and refunds in excess of 1.5 million. Okay, so it's been around now, you know, for two years that they can check. So that is, a, that is a beneficial dollar amount. So clearly it's helping somebody. Um, okay, and that was a quarterly reporting period, the 266. So they want you to just go to the NFAP, check that, check your other resources before you get to them. They want to make sure that you go through that. So you go to the NFIP webpage, you go to FloodSmart. Um, FloodSmart's got a cool tool on it. You can plug in your address and it estimates what your flood insurance cost would be. So uh, someone not in a floodplain, their, ins their flood insurance cost would probably be eight or $900. You plug in my address, it'd say, hi, $5,000. Um, insurance agent, you've gone to them, you've tried to work through your adjuster and you've checked with your FEMA regional office. Um, there's the map information office if it's about are you or are you not in the map office. So there's two kinds of changes. One, you need to change me because you made a mistake. Two, you need to change me because I've done something like elevated my house. They talk about fill dirt. Fill dirt isn't allowed for residential in Houston, but other people apparently can use it. We've got grandfathering clauses. Um, you can call their support center, their help center. 
your local planning, building, inspection, zoning offices. Those are the people that, do, that send you the letter, whether or not you're significantly damaged or not. And as someone mentioned the other day, there's a lot of people that we all suspect are significantly damaged and they're just rebuilding without permits. If the permit office found out, that'd be a problem. If they didn't get their substantially damaged letter, we're just gonna have people rebuilding that are flooding again. And if your flood department does not strictly enforce that, the entire city of Houston, in theory, could lose their flood insurance because that's what the flood department does is it protects all of us by enforcing their rules. And one city here recently, they decided that since all these people are gonna be significantly damaged, we're not gonna use our current flood map. We're gonna go back and use our 2012 flood map. That hit the Chronicle too. These are problems. So if you've done everything that was on the list, contact them through their website. Here's what I don't like about their website. They're like, fill in your information and we'll get back to you. I hate that. Um, so it's okay, I've got the two lead people and the last slide is their names and contact information. Um, so that's what it's supposed to do. It's an intermediary thing, it should be of use. I know people from the local Facebook page that say, I actually got the Facebook administrator and said, go ask anybody if they're using this. Let me know what the results are. So what came back was some people didn't get contacted and other people are like, yeah, it worked great for me. And not a lot of people seem to be using it. I don't know if it's because they don't know about it or not. Um, so if you've got the wrong rate, they might give you your rate back. Um, I had duplicate coverage. I got my bill at my old rate and then I got elevated and then my renewal came and I got a new bill and I didn't know what it was. I paid them both. I couldn't figure it out. So I paid them both and then we go, okay, I've paid them both. So I uh, got a refund on the first one, the big one, because that was the old rate as opposed to the new rate. If I didn't get help with that, this is a good office to go to. Um, Sorry, this print's a little tiny for me. Um, none of it is, um, okay, most of their help is not significant financial assistance, so it's not like you're gonna go in with no coverage and they give you a check for 250, so they wanna make sure you know that. Um, they, their goal is to help you better utilize what exists already. They're sort of the last helper before. Resources, here's the act that created it, the Flood Insurance Affordability Act. Here's the Flood Insurance Advocate Office fact sheet. They've got like a one or two page fact sheet. Here's their advocate program page, which we're all used to using the internet. Um, you can just click all over there and see tons of stuff that I didn't think you needed to see on um, a PowerPoint. Um, they have FAQs and everything else, just like everyone else. So the leads are Rhonda Montgomery and David Stirrett. And you're gonna get a copy of the PowerPoint and there's their direct emails. So if you use this and you fill out the form that they're supposed to contact you and they don't, now you know who to talk to. <laughs> so you might guess where I got that. Um, best practices, use them if the other things aren't working. First we try to work it. Um, some people have had really good um, results from getting other contracts, and some people haven't. So if you can't get any help from the adjuster that came as a, their contract workers for your flood insurance agent, then this is another option, and I just wanted you to know so it was in your toolkit. Thank you. Martin, more. Hey, two more comments. I want, I want to make two more comments. Number one, the least informed insurance agent is the one who's trying to sell you flood insurance. They do, they do not understand flood insurance and there's mm -hmm. always problems. I, they will sell somebody a policy for $200,000 and no contents coverage. They will say, you got a $300,000 house, so we're gonna give you 150 in homeowners and 150 in flood, so you're fully covered. The other thing for you guys in Florida, she mentioned that Turo Law Firm, uh, I mean, Turo Law School, it's in New York and they created a clinic for their students just to handle insurance claims, flood and windstorm claims out of Sandy. My friend Dennis Abbott, who wrote this book, lives in Destin, Florida, and he was counselor to those guys and very much in touch. So if y'all find, and I can tell you how to get a hold of him, he is generous with his help, 
and he's handling claims in Florida right now because yes, he works with a lawyer out of Pensacola. Uh, and he would be happy to advise you all and help you if you need information or feedback with your claims in Florida, okay? I just want to make sure you knew that. Thank you, Mark. Great. I cannot thank you both enough. This was extremely informative.